So um, thanks everybody for coming along today. I know it's, it's a very busy time of the semester and we've had a few um, apologies sent by people who are under the pump for teaching starting next week. So it's really fantastic to have this crowd assembled here today. And I'm going to be our chair today um, on behalf of the C3P committee. Um, and first of all, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the country where University of Wollongong is situated and pay respect to uh, elders past, present and emerging. And today's, uh, we have three presentations um, from Aaron Burton, from Sue Turnbull and from Kate Middleton. And I think most of you will have seen the materials that were posted onto the website of the C3P. So the, the, for those of you who have not come along to one of these gatherings before, the idea that we've been kind of working with is that each presenter gets about half an hour of time um, and has a nominated respondent. So the materials are uploaded to the website a week in advance so that there's a chance for us to have a look at them before we arrive. And then the respondent works with the um, presenter to um, draw out some of the, um, the, the aspects of the work that, that are um, interesting to the respondent as a way of kind of modelling and leading the conversation and the dialogue that then we expand out to include the whole group that's gathered here. So we, you know, a standard way of organising things would be in three lots of 10 minutes. So the, the first 10 minutes being um, uh, the, the presentation of some sort of primary materials, then the respondent in conversation with the presenter and then opening up to the whole of the, the group that's gathered. But that's quite flexible. So um, some of you who are working respondent presenter will, have, will be using your time differently. So you can just let us know um, if you want to kind of break with that model. And my job as the chair is really just to kind of keep the time and um, remind you, I'll butt in from time to time and let you know how, how you're going on time. And um, the, the purpose is to, um, you know, in this, in this very difficult, in this very difficult time for all of us, um, there's been a lot of focus on our admin and teaching work and um, a lot of resources have been taken away from us in terms of our research stuff. So it's an opportunity here for a collegial gathering to remind ourselves that we are researchers and that we're all doing amazing stuff and support each other in that process and just do it regularly like this in a semi-monthly format um, without too much pressure. Um, and often we, have, we share work in progress um, and some of the most interesting things that emerge from the work in progress are where the presenter obtains, willingly obtains feedback from the, um, the audience and uses that in, in kind of continuing to progress their work. So that's kind of to give you a bit of a sense of the, the culture that's been developing in these gatherings over the last three or four months. So um, the schedule that we have today um, with Aaron, with Sue and with Kate, um, I think that is the order that we have them on the website, which is fairly arbitrary, but um, unless anybody feels like we should do something differently, we might just keep with that format. Um, so in that, in that sense, our first presenter is Aaron Burton and his respondent, Madeline Goddard. And we welcome Madeline, who's um, an outsider to our faculty. And um, through your dialogue, Aaron and Madeline, you can um, introduce yourselves, um, tell us about where you come from, what your disciplines are and so on. and, um, and uh, and then we'll flesh out some of the kind of um, concerns and interests and aesthetics that are emerging from the work. So I might pass over to Aaron and Madeline who can tell us how they'd like to organise um, the next half an hour of our time with you. Sure, thanks Lucas and thanks everyone for this opportunity. Um, <clears throat> we thought it would be a nice opportunity to actually share a little video that we made. Some of you might have watched it already through the Vimeo link and we were talking about before how to how to watch it in this space. And it might be nice if um, we, we go away for 10 or 12 minutes to watch the link and come back so everyone has seen it um, as a kind of example of perhaps a practice-based research. Um, to put it in a little bit of context though, uh, um, 
Maddie, my partner, Madeline, um, <clears throat> uh, was forwarded a, a, an opportunity with the National Science Week NT to do a short video, which is a, a, you know, it's normally these pub outings and so on, these events, but this year, given COVID, they asked for videos from the community. And so we got a little tiny grant to piece something together. Um, so normally this would have been a film that we'd actually make in the field about mangroves and about research about the science that Maddie's been doing as part of her PhD research in Darwin. Um, but we kind of had to just cobble together what we got. And I had this footage from this, um, fisherman hero. So, um, we've made this little short film for science week. So I guess there is a, a an audience there that's about kind of, in, uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, general public, uh, education context. Um, we're interested in engaging people and, um, um, uh, yeah, Maddie, do you have anything else to say about the film before we kind of cut to it? I think we should watch it and then we'll have a big discussion about it afterwards. Okay. So Great. So I've posted the, um, the link over there in the chat. Um, I hope everyone can see that. And, um, so what we should do is just mute ourselves here on the zoom and then click on that link, put in the password and, um, uh, and then we'll see each other back here uh, once we finish watching the film. All right. So people I think everybody's still... coming coming back. Yeah. Thank you very much, Aaron and Madeline. Thank you. I'll pass over to you guys to to begin your discussion. Okay. Uh, so thanks for watching our video. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at Charles Darwin University in the Australian National University. Um, I'm about halfway through my PhD, doing it part time because I have a small child um, and I spent a lot of time in the mangroves <clears throat> and well, I think they're really beautiful, but the work that I do as a scientist doesn't really reflect, um, doesn't really capture that. You know, I'm writing a lot of um, journal articles that are for a very expert audience and so an opportunity to share um, what I'm doing with a wider audience, um, I think is really wonderful, but it's also quite challenging um, to communicate effectively, um, you know, not to use all the, the scientific jargon that I'm, you know, sort of rewarded for in my field, but um, doesn't really translate to everyone else. So yeah, it was sort of really nice to work with Aaron, who's a filmmaker, to share these beautiful, um, sites that I work in and you know some of them are uh, earmarked for development in Darwin Harbour it's sort of it's pristine um, and we're so lucky to have this you know 20,000 hectares of mangroves um, and you know lots of people fish um, the Amateur Fishing Association is really powerful in Darwin um, and yeah and so we've got this, this ecosystem that sits next to this capital city in Darwin um, and yeah just to, to bring people into it and to share that was sort of why I wanted to make this film. Um, but then Aaron made it into a fishing film. So, and tell me why we, why we did that, Aaron. Thanks, Maddie. Um, <clears throat> I, guess, I guess to put it in broader context, this is kind of the third film that we've made together that's a kind of short science um, focused film. And um, uh, actually, I was thinking this morning, Maddie, that since I met you, you've appeared in everything that I've made. So, I, <laughs> I mean, you're kind of corrupting my work as well. Um, but it's, it's, I think, so the previous two that we'd done were, were set in field work in Indonesia about mangroves as well. And they were kind of more method oriented. They were kind of about the research that was underway. Um, and given COVID um, being a lockdown, so normally Maddie would be in the field this time of year and we were planning to actually do some filming up in Darwin again. Um, <clears throat> and given the, the kind of the, the, the science week frame, um, I thought it'd be nice to try something different and use what we had with this, this um, fishing footage with Hiro um, <clears throat> and to make it into a little story. And I've been very interested you know, and, and Maddie as well, I, you know, if I can say that um, in this science communication space and just looking across all your faces now, there's a number of you that are quite sort of um, profound in this area of um, science communication um, and using different kind of uh, uh, devices to, to communicate, um, uh, you know, ecological crisis or Anthropocene. 
Um, and I was kind of inspired to try and marry these two different things. And there are a few points of interest or points of tension in the form of the film itself in terms of a personal documentary with Hero uh, against an expository approach with Maddie, uh, with music and everything. Um, and also I have an interest in the tension between those forms and the unmanned imagery as well. So the drone and the satellite um, and the action camera, the kind of unmanned space. And lastly, I think um, I'm currently interested in a kind of exaggerated bricolage culture or what I'm, or what I'm kind of trying to label bricolage culture of just kind of making stuff out of what we've got that we do have, you know, following the tours lead, I guess, this kind of end of modernity, of all this media and stuff that we can just make things out of what we've got. Um, there's this kind of reconstruction of what's already there. So, you know, I think it's this nice time or it's a nice opportunity to really get these points of tension happening. Um, so for me, I'm interested in uh, seeing Hero's story against Maddie's as kind of two different epistemologies, if you like, you know, the, the, the everyday fishing story and, and, and fishing being storytelling is, is kind of classic um, against this kind of science, which is, you know, uh, perceived, well, it's, it's, it's complex. It's, 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 it's whether it should be communicated in a basic way is an argument in itself. I think a discussion in itself. Um, so yeah, with, I guess, Maddie, I don't know if you want to talk about that, that balancing act at all, like how, how do you feel happy with this as a kind of science communication or is it just kind of a, an advertisement or, 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 um, I'm not sure where we conclude this chapter before opening up. I'm aware of the time, but Maddie, do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, I guess um, by bringing in Hero, you really broad bring in a, a great greater audience and a greater interest, and also that you know that personal um, storytelling and sort of it's got this whole build up like, is he going to catch a thousand? Is it, you know, um, sort of I guess makes the story more compelling while. <clears throat> On one side, I guess what I'm saying is sort of it's a little bit dry, could be perceived as quite didactic, um, like telling people. And in order to illustrate this, we sort of had, well, here's people using this space, um, you know, catching all these fish um, that isn't just a scientist. It's, it, it is a bit broader. Um, yeah, but I, I guess maybe other people have a comment on like their experience with science communication, where it's good, where it's bad, um, and yeah, where where that personal um, stories can really enhance it, or whether it detracts. Like that's fine if you think that too. Um, so, would you like to um, open up to the to discussion, Aaron and Madeline? Yeah, I'm sure yeah, that our audience has have some responses for you. Yeah, that would be great. So anyone who wants to just um, unmute yourself and jump in. All right, I'll jump in. Um, oh, okay. I thought um, it was great. Thanks, both of you. Really, really interesting. And I was really interested in that cross between the personal story and the, the, the science kind of um, exploration. Maddie, I thought that the, what worked with you was the visual imagery. You know, so that why what you were saying was, you know, this is how the mangroves work and this is the destruction. The visual imagery was so amazing. I mean, I could have watched that film just with you. So it, it would have, because the visual imagery works, which is so fantastic, works with your voice to kind of give us this emotional um, and visual experience. So that's great. Um, so I think either would work. I like the twisting because... Um, it, it just it gave us this personal experience of Hero and what he's been through. I mean, I wondered actually how you found Hero. Was that was was that just through the newspaper, or did you do you know Hero? He's a bit of a celebrity in the NT. You see him on his scooter with a barramundi hanging off it. Um, and yeah, Aaron, how did you? Um, yeah, he, he's, a, he's a known kind of identity around Darwin as a kind of fisherman. He's got a column in the paper about fishing and stuff. And um, yeah, I, I, I started following him just, I was working at the NT News. I thought it'd be a good story to kind of, you know, do a piece about him. And um, I just followed him and learned about all his fish and then thought it'd be a nice little film to do up to a thousandth fish. Um, but then I kind of followed him so much that I just got into fishing myself and never made anything of it. <laughs> I kind of just 
put the camera down and picked up a fishing rod instead. It was more fun. And the thing that interested me was not his thousand fish, but his respect for the yeah. fish. To put back the mother fish, he's saying thank you fish every time, which is, a, you know, kind of a, at least part of some Japanese culture. And I thought it was interesting that he was Japanese and it was a, I thought that was really interesting choices. Yeah, I thought it was really important, like his, his attitude towards the whole fishing thing was really important. I think it could have, um, I could have felt very uncomfortable if it had it been like a very traditional fishing, like um, sort of taking hunt sort of, Thing. so it was he has a really lovely res yeah respect for it um that didn't make me feel very uncomfortable about um putting these things side by side and and that was a, a kind of a, a very nuanced issue as well because we were conscious of making him look like a kind of baddie um and i uh, probably the, the the piece of the film that i'm the least comfortable about is that kind of jazz music um and I found that it actually, and normally I wouldn't use stock like that at all. And, and I kind of resisted a lot and we might actually get a friend to do a new, new piece for it. But I found without the music, Maddie's second narration with that sigh and those lines about the environment were, were really quite harsh. And when it cut to hero after that, it, it made him look like he was the baddie. Um, but that music, interestingly enough, seemed to just soften what she said enough and generalize it if you like um that it wasn't aimed at hero uh which i thought was a really interesting little nuance in the in the editing but i, I think going back to the I'm, I'm not you know we were talking about the japanese thing before and the risk of sort of, uh, of going into that aesthetics but i also think it's a darwin thing don't you maddie there's a kind of a, a real kind of respect or appreciation of the natural environment just because so much of of you know daily life and activities is that interaction um and you know, everyone knows if a, if a bar is bigger than uh, seventy five centimeters, it's a mother fish. So you don't keep those. I mean, if you did that, that'd be criminal. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's yeah. also there's something very Darwin in that film that I'm not sure that anyone picked up on. But when I'm watching it and he's standing knee deep in the water, I'm just going like, ah, crocodiles. Crocodile, um, yeah. So I think people in Darwin might have a bit bit of a different reaction to it. They might be going, oh, this guy's a bit crazy, <laughs> or you know. Good on him. Yeah. I um, you know, I thought it was, I thought it was great. I, what I, what I, as I was watching, I was going. Uh, the juxtaposition was interesting. Say, so, okay, we've got a fisher, we've got a fisher, and now we've got a scientist, and we're going to see this, this sort of play off against each other. As it, as it moved along, the understanding of it being a science communication was, was really clear because one, we had Maddie, but then we had. I don't know. We've got, we've got a natural scientist in, in the in the Fisher himself, who's who's basically showing that science isn't isn't a realm that is um, that should be exclusive. It should be. It should actually. It's something that we, we all share. We might not un understand it all to uh, equal levels, but there's parts of us that are all all getting it and tr and working together. Might not might not be working together all the time, but that really showed the, the coming together of two worlds to achieve you know really um, similar outcomes i thought that was really good the other thing that i noticed that i find when our journalists and students and the journalists i've worked with and myself when we deal with when we deal with scientists they love the opportunity to be able to tell their stories generally a lot of them just need a little bit of encouragement to do it and the opportunity provided to do it and i think this is, that's what makes this really strong too so well done thanks sean um nikki uh, i think nikki had a had a was waiting there go for it nikki well um yes i had a different uh, reaction and it was so interesting to hear um you talk maddie and aaron about it but um i actually thought that you were creating a a kind of face-off between two very different attitudes um, to the environment and perhaps it's because I'm coming from an animal studies perspective and so I don't feel it's showing respect to the fish to catch them I think that's really cruel to catch and release like that that's a lot of trauma for the fish and the idea that you would be doing that sort of for sport and just to reach a certain number um, that made my stomach clench 
And then every time we came back to those ravishing images of um, the underwater forests and, and the beautiful narration about the mango forests, I felt my stomach unclenching. So <laughs> I had this really um, seesawing emotional reaction to the film um, between on the one hand, the sort of, to me, the human sort of attitude towards um, the natural environment, an attitude that I don't like. Um, and then on the other hand, how generous the environment has been to us and how much we need to do to protect it. So just offering another, this is how I responded. Yeah, um, I guess like there is a, um, a like people who do go out fishing, um, it is a very, in, like it's quite intense thing. And if it isn't for food, although Hero will eat it when um, it is a, with it, when it is within the limits, um, he's not always just going out to catch numbers. It, I guess that became a, a beat up through the newspaper. Um, rather than his own experience. But yeah, and I can see how um, that is, a, you know, a lot of fishing is quite destructive, you know, uh, well, like we didn't talk about, you know, the, the fishing line that gets left behind um, and all these other things, like it could be explored a lot more because it is quite, you know, a complex thing um, and how people um, interact with the environment and stuff is, you know, very, very broad and, you know, a huge spectrum of, of people um, interacting with that. So that is really interesting that people also got that too, like, um, yeah. Um, Madeline and Aaron, I just, just wanted to congratulate you. I thought it was great. Um, I, that, because I, uh, you know, my first view of Hero there at the start, I was, I, I assumed that set up as the baddie and I thought oh right this is going to be very clear cut you know Maddie's going to tell us that mangroves are important that's we'll probably all agree and and Hero will be the wacky kind of baddie but I actually thought it was really clever that it didn't to me anyway it didn't come across as that clear cut um, you know the excitement going along with Hero and and Black Cat said the way thanked the fish and you know regardless of whether fishing you see fishing is bad or not um so i i thought that complexity was really excellent and it uh made me as an audience i guess we're talking about audiences in general today um feel much more engaged with also what you were saying because it freshened your message as well that's yeah the complexity was Good. I thought it was great. Thanks, Jen. We we have reached the end of our half hour. So um, at the end of all of our um, presentations, we can uh, loop back around and have a more general discussion and pick up some of these points again. But um, thank you so much, Madeline. Thanks, and everyone. That oh, was great. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we now turn to Sue Turnbull and your respondent. Um, I'm just trying to find you here on the screen. Where it's are you? Lucas. Renee Middlemost, there you are. Um, Lucas, yeah. I've just had a notification from my computer that it's going to restart itself in 15 minutes. So um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, Sue. I might have to change computers. Um, so it might be best to keep things moving and maybe move to the next presenter. I'm yeah, so sorry. We can, if you like. If Sue, are you happy to do that? I can't cancel it. I've cancelled it the maximum <laughs> yeah, um, amount of times. I know the kind of thing. Um, yeah. So if that if everybody's happy, then we'll switch to um, Kate Middleton's presentation first, and your respondent Joshua Lobb. So sorry, we'll Sue. Back, come back to Renee when <laughs> you're. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> cool. So um, over to you, Kate and Joshua. Thank you. Thanks, Lucas, and thanks everybody. Um, so the way in which we thought we would run today is because we've got the, a range of poems to look at, um, and we've got the poet in the room with us. Literally, well, not literally. Um, uh, if uh, if Kate might want to share some poems, and then we'll have a little bit of a chat about some of the poems, and then Kate will do another reading, and we'll chat a little bit a little bit about that. So, um, if you haven't had a chance to 
um, read them. We'll, we'll listen to some of them and we can build a conversation from there. But hopefully you've had a chance to read all of all the things that Kate sent through. So welcome, Kate. I'm, I'm really pleased to be working with you on, on these poems. I think they're, they're beautiful and crazy and wonderful and um, upsetting in lots of ways. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we move through. Yeah, um, the crazy is, is the word that I keep coming back to. <laughs> um, so as part of the reason I wanted to read just a couple of them to begin was also just, I know that poetry is a form that a lot of people find a bit confronting or don't know how to read and sometimes hearing it um, does help. They are still in process, although some of them have been published, but the manuscript as a whole is constantly undergoing pretty radical revisions. <laughs> Um, so I was going to read the third poem uh, and probably number 11. So I'll just start with the number three. When the soap star faced accusations, when the sitcom star faced accusations, when the novelty star faced accusations, some days it seems like all the reassuring hams of broadcast have had their masks ripped off. And yes, when it comes to reporting the sex crimes of the once were rich and famous, it all resembles Scooby-Doo more than SVU, at least so long as tabloids print, reprint their remorseless, voided faces. Do not focus on the jagged, nerved victims. A facade falls and the portrait of Dorian Gray limbs alarmingly ordinary. We used to watch Hey Dad. As a family, my mum liked Nudge. And I was delighted when I found Walgett on a map. Walgett, a real place, not a television place. I wanted to go there like the day years later we drove my cousins to Bonnie Doon and they sang, as you must now, we're going to Bonnie Doon. Because what they wanted was not the destination, but the journeying towards. My parents sure that the joke of being from Walgut, this joke somehow got laughs, was the best thing about Walgut. We never went. In suburban Sydney, the sitcom architect turned sinister, hey dad, you're worthy of Twin Peaks now. There's a real evil in these studio lots. Twin Peaks which is not a real place name, but the town is real, the diner's real, the Douglas fir trees and the Douglas fir tree scent all real. The question who killed Laura Palmer posed midway through Hey Dad's run. But on another channel, the ads for it, the mystery lingering a decade before I watched. Yet I watched it too. Laura's trauma played out on Hey Dad's set, not yet knowing what I saw. A daughter later recast, now emerging to break nostalgia's grip. It's happening again. And when the stories broke, a long parade of faces, again, reassuring as childhood, broken as childhood, looking up the history, Walgut's our hope, where waters converge, hey dad never mentioned it, of course, the sight of freedom rides the protest, that history has nothing to add to the white, hapless, single dad narrative, so I suppose we should be grateful that at least Betty was played for laughs and not for sex appeal, and that Laura Palmer played for sex was at least shown cyanotic, swaddled in death, in plastic, wrapped in all the damage we've endured. Um, and just the number 11. Uh, it's always Hannah alone, Hannah eating cupcakes, their pig faces taunting her with memory. When I explain girlhood, I come back to this, what bullying means, the knowledge that she's done this before, that she's thrown up in some public bathroom deliberately, and this is normal. Not normal for me, but sometimes I wonder that I never tried it, perhaps because I worried for my teeth for enamel that cannot be remade. I know that the story is not Hannah in the bathroom and that they were all themselves at some time bullies. And yet what we see, what we understand is suffering. The facade of the new it girl discarded in a moment of fear, the moment when eating piggies could save everything. I like the moment when to sink into TV and comfort food is the only possibility. Or Spencer in her car, applying mascara again, breaking down again, the effort to be whole too much, and those black streaks just evidence of this, dwelling in the unbearable, silent, on the stuck needle of grief, betrayal. The actress says in interviews, the worse Spencer looks, the better she, the actress feels, inhabiting some human extreme and pausing, unbearable, unbearable. Like the timeline, the one we obsessives pick over, the one that makes no damn sense, the one with all those bodies, bodies that drop in just weeks, but years, this damn town. Two years dwelling on an elastic month accordion to utmost calamity. How often does TV operate on time sickness? Distort our own sense of what is possible. When does Jack Bauer sleep? Like once the time, six months after my last day homesick, I turned on the bold and the beautiful to find Ridge's lost love still kidnapped, still just on the verge of escape. The endless plot, another illustration of the risk of being a body, female, out in public, the illness of being a body, 
the melody of time spent dwelling in the open eyes on you and on Rosemont at Rosewood High, the wondrous ludicrous not quite a month somehow true to despair and self-doubt and homework and heartbreak and mean girls and mean days and you know this damn school. I went to one of them too until at last the girls bodies snatched table a sedation them waking as if from death but actually a greater violation. What is it to lose time, to lose mind, to lose the whole lot to the house and the house is the town, is the show, is the audience, not just the anonymous bully. The house is it all, is you, is me, watching the struggle to even understand what could be real anymore. Real doesn't matter. What matters is a strong brow, a perfectly glossed lip and a finger raised to the mouth and a complicit shh. Hey, Kate, yep. Round of applause for Kate. Um, I was really wonderful to hear you. Oh, sorry, we'll take the pause. There we go. Um, uh, I have I've forgotten how to do any kind of communication because um, I've been away for a couple of days. Um, uh, the first thing I wanted to say, Kate, was thank you for reading them because the 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 sense that I got when I was reading them on, in in my own mind was that kind of relentlessness of it, um, the way in which. Um, the, the, the run-on feels like the way in which we binge watch television. So it's that kind of feeling of the, the overwhelmingness of things. Oh, should we watch another one? Should we not watch another one? And how that kind of plays out there. The other thing I wanted to pick up on was something that you said just at the beginning there, which was uh, before you read, which is about the kind of inaccessibility or accessibility of this work um, and, and of, and of uh, television and of poetry. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a writer, but I'm still scared of poems. Um, <laughs> And I find that what's really interesting about television is that it also has this kind of sense of being accessible, um, but in some, some ways it's completely incomprehensible. Um, and poetry works in the same kind of way that poetry seems inaccessible, but sometimes it can get you right, for, a lot of the time it can get you right in the heart. Um, so I wanted to talk about that relationship between the kind of form and the content. Why did you choose this particular um, form, this kind of um, couplets form? And the, the run on, you know, the, the, the run on in terms of the lines, but also the run on in terms of the poems that they move on and on and on. Is that part of the project? What, how's that working? Or why did you choose that form? Yeah, so um, the form, as I said, is borrowed from A.R. Ammons, which was in the, the note at the top. And so this is the form with the couplets and the constant, only the use of semicolons, never an ending sentence of his work, Garbage, um, which is an amazing book length poem about garbage and so in a way this is a response to another little world that contains everything that touches and infects everything we do um and that sense of both the binge watching that you mentioned but also i was trying to find a poetic form that sort of both reflected streaming culture but also channel surfing um and the way in which That's like yeah. on uh, um obviously we get that sense obviously of we're watching, 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 and then something puts us into this sort of reverie of remembrance or it gets us. Um, but also thinking through how I was using that form, wanting to think about that idea that um, of that in the accessibility and inaccessibility, like you stumble into a fan world, which um, I, I spend a lot of time on Reddit when I'm like, can't use my brain anymore. Um, and it, it's completely incomprehensible to people who are not in that world. Um, my part, where I'm staying at the moment, um, I'm sort of helping my partner's parents, but we've also got my partner's stepdaughter in the house and she and I have these conversations at the dinner table and my partner's mum is listening to us saying, I understand the words, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and so wanting to sort of reflect that but make it accessible through affect, so where Ammons is sort of thinking about garbage as touching everything, he's also writing about, you know, how soybeans are a cheap, complete protein for him to eat. Um, and so garbage culture as a whole and consumer culture. And this is like the other form of consumer culture, I guess. Um, and in terms of sort of accessibility and inaccessibility, the other thing I'm thinking about with the form of these is they're poems, but they're also kind of essays. Um, their memoir, but they're thinking like they get close and then they get a bit distant, etc. Um, so, in that sense, like I've been interested in the advent of the lyric essay and creative writing, but feel that there's also that idea that um, 
in terms of the lyric essay, there's actually not enough of the, the lyric form in the lyric essay and actually poetry and essay have a really long linked history um, as well. And then the memoir side, like people really prize biblio memoirs because that's really um, prestigious to read books. But um, when I read biographies, I'm like, where's all the time we spend watching TV? Like, guys, you have TVs. You totally. <laughs> I'm not the only one that wastes all my time. So. Yeah. There's some thoughts. Cool, uh, and I, um, it's it's that that idea also. I mean, you've got the, the the line in the poem which says, "Television is a form which encompasses everything." So it's that kind of strange thing that it's omnipresent. It's not that it's not that it, it it encompasses everything in terms of subject matter, but it also we're encompassed by it, which I think is quite extraordinary. And that links back to the memoir thing that you've mentioned here is that the the sense of self that comes into the text. I mean, even, even in the, the poem we just read about your relationship with, with Walgett and Hey Dad, and how that runs alongside um, that poem. I want to move into the, the Hey Dad poem and the sort of link to Laura Palmer there. There's obviously a, a very strong sense of kind of me too, um, a very strong feminist response to the, the text and in, in, um, the television in, in this form, putting Hey Dad and, and the, um, the, uh, abuse case alongside Twin Peaks and the kind of David Lynch um, agenda um, obviously plays um, with a particular aggression. And in a minute, we'll hear from your, the, the um, Crown poem and the way in which the Royal Family and the Crown and Prince Andrew runs alongside each other in that poem. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that because we've had a conversation about um, 90210 and the turning on Brenda movement as well. Um, and I, uh, I can't remember if that's in the poems that you gave us or if it's outside of that, but if you could talk a little bit about the, the kind of feminist agenda that you've got running through this, through the work. Yeah, so, I mean, there are a couple of different starting points to the project that sort of um, spurred it on. And one of it, um, one of the things that I'd read not long before was um, an article in The Guardian uh, about the mentrification um, the idea that what teen girls are into isn't taken terribly seriously uh, until, you know, grown men take it up. So the example was Beatlemania. Beatlemania, you get all those photos from the 60s of screaming teenage girls. Ah! Uh, and then suddenly they're a classic because um, grown men have, it, have to have that in the record collection. Uh, and so there's this sort of disconnect of things that get really prized by young women but also they're really teaching you how to be a woman. And like, as I was writing these, I was also thinking about the fact that 90210 started when I was 12 uh, and it was sold to me in all of the teen magazines that I was already reading as I was preparing to be a teen as this thing. And like, you know, I had older brothers who were way brothery. They tried to raise me as a boy and then gave up on me. And so I had to learn how to be, you know, a girl in this world. And one of the things I was left with was 90210, which is incredibly problematic. Um, and so I don't, I don't think I put the Brenda poem in there, but the idea there was this like, Brenda is this character in 90210 who you're clearly set up to be the one to identify with. They anticipated a largely female audience. The first couple of seasons, you really have Brenda and then her real life behavior suddenly infects the character and everyone's attitude to her. You get the I hate Brenda newsletter in the zine world. Um, and so first of all, an audience turns on Brenda and then the show turns on Brenda and you're suddenly meant to hate her. And so I'm wondering like from one perspective about girlhood, what does it mean when you're invited to identify with a character and then that character gets turned on? So suddenly the person you're trying to be is the person that everyone hates. Um, and then also thinking through not just this Me Too moment that's happened right now, but also thinking through about how it is that actually, you know, these stories have been playing out for years and years and years and years. Um, and that I've been writing an essay about Shannon Doherty in contrast to like Luke Perry being beloved and missed and her cancer, but also this question. Um, and like, you know, going back to transcripts of like an interview with Eddie Vedder dissing her and then Eddie Vedder showing up on Twin Peaks and sort of understanding female trauma suddenly 25 years later. So there's all of these different threads that are kind of in a jumble in my head and I haven't, because I'm now also trying to write some essays about them um, that have to do with that idea of 
the illness of being a body and a female body um, as well, uh, as well as like, you know, likability and that whole problem. Um, There's a very yeah. strong kind of um, bodily response in many ways. And, and, and the thing that, that it's, it's, it speaks to me really strongly in terms of time of COVID as well, you've got lots of bacteria kind of virus references in the in the text um the, there's a line which says television pr proliferates inside my body like so much gut bacteria um i wondered lucas do we have time for, for for kate to read another poem and then we have a little bit of a chat about the kind of bacteria and the kind of covert reading of this these poems is that possible yeah, yep. go for it kate would you mind reading the crown poem and then i've got a couple of questions around that, that, this is my favourite poem, just possibly because I'm, I'm uh, obsessed and embarrassed about how much I love the royal family and the crown. Oh, that's um, so cute. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, a cast changeover, not a second string, but mid-career, mid-life, reshuffle, churn. Or the reminder that we all gain that second chin or its equivalent in time, season three, safe in the realm of historical memory, but episode one and my mother unsure of this new queen. She tells me how much she liked Claire Foy, Foy's radiance, radiance of coronation, annunciation, capturing a sense of something lost in us by years. Then episode two, the switch to Margaret, scandalous. And episode three, it's coal, collieries, slurry the need for stricter regulation, the bodies of how many children, 116, buried under the labour we still want to give a working class for which we'll lease new seams, the labour we still heroise in images as our televisions blaze out late into the night, then there it is, the vision of the mountain sliding down itself, engulfing the classroom, engulfing every notion of innocence, over so quickly yet unforgettable. I look up the psychological studies, the lasting testimonies, reactions of the surviving children, the Pied Piper brought the mountain to them, and yet some escaped the Piper's wrath. When the Piper is an earth hollowed out and then refilled, his wrath is terrible and inexact. The children tell the aftermath, the wish to disappear, retreat indoors, retreat to silent footsteps, downcast looks, the sense that existing in view is just a reminder to the parents of the lost, of what is lost, everything. And yet, carry on, there is a better world to forge. When I write, I'm aware that each phrase, each opinion alienates me from half the population, my politics inescapably detectable, and television helps to reinforce this rift. We can agree on Foy's radiance, but not facts. Still, by episode three, we have adjusted to this new vision, coal a crisis replacing fog, smog. Mere career, mid-career must be a rough spot for a monarch too. Sheen worn off, an image showing scuffs, an abafan, deluge of slurry, of collapsing mountainside, of landscape inundated with black, blackening despair. We watch the years tick past, the crown, a moving image timeline, and the welling tear, the second welling tear, a moment still, a moment beyond embattlement and politics, a moment deep in self-doubt and self-reflection. Who hasn't thought what this queen says at some time, I have known for some time that there is something wrong with me, some time all of the time. There is surely something wrong with each of us. I've always cried too much, once got set home from school for excessive anguish. So surely there is something wrong with me to be so swept ineluctably into such feeling. Perhaps an early sign of future diagnosis and the twice tried drawdown from the years of medication, lacrimose weeks, months, and then the doctors stating, well, I guess the pills do something. Now Olivia Coleman is the new Becky, alongside an age-lined barrage of new Beckys, old Beckys only ever glimpsed in memory, and Becky an Aristotelian recognition of species through the filtering out of any particulars arrival at the essence, while the promise of the next generation comes into view. Meanwhile, Prince Andrew, stepping back. This from television to disastrous interview, backlash, audience primed to outrage, scripted into choice of villain, concentrating discontent, and the pronouncement from the palace never quite attuned to current feeling, as if such tempering is ever possible. They, we, learn it all again. There is no commensuration. Thank you, Kate. Thank you very much. Uh, again, round of applause for Kate. Okay, so here's my COVID reading of this poem. Um, there's a there's a moment in the in the in the poem where you talk about that we're getting used. To, there's, a, there's a line I can't remember the exact words about getting used to the the change, um, and I think that there's something really interesting about your poetry, in the way that I mean, and, and why why it's interesting in relation to the crown is that the crown is in some ways tracing a history or tracing a kind of history. You know, it's got the the, the particular large scale events and it's got the sort of history of this this family, and then you're tracing the tracing of that history. Um, and your poems often have that kind of relationship um, with the LA fires, for instance, that you're engaging with, with particular historical moments. Um, and so there's a kind of, 
interesting thing there where it's about how do we record history, but there's also a kind of sense that that by recording it, we're also eroding it. Um, and there's a kind of sense that, that the crown is an interesting case because it's 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 um, trying to uh, sheen, place a sheen over over a place which is which is eroded and and is um, kind of infecting itself and and Prince Andrew and all of the kind of hideousness of capitalism of monarchy all, all sorts of things in that space. So, my that's that's how I read this poem is that it's that that sense of we're adjusting we're adjusting we're adjusting we're recreating history we're we're reframing it. And at the same time, that's eroding and eroding and eroding what we value or what we understand of the world. Um, is that a fair reading of your work is my first question. And my second question, which is a sort of journalistic question, um, which is, have you considered engaging with COVID and, and the virus and, and our experiences now in relation to watching television? Because I think we've changed watching the way in which we watch television now because we're always involved in screens. In a, in a particular way now. Um, sorry for those questions. No, no, okay. Um, so yes, I think that's a pretty fair reading and that sense not just of how we record history and how history erodes, but how much it's pre-written for us. Like that idea that, you know, Prince Andrew is the scripted villain, yeah. uh, you know, that actually all the Epstein stuff was around for years. And then finally the Miami journalists like chased it and like made it a thing and, you know, for say, no, this has to be the attention and that it's been slippery and that it wasn't able to stick to these different figures in the U S and finally, suddenly the outcry comes to Prince Andrew and it's that sort of, okay, we're scripting it. He's, you know, he's not in America. He's protected in some way by being a Royal and thus like we can all hate him. Um, and so when it's thinking about that structure of power and where all that Epstein stuff has like filtered, um, there's that. So, you know, just like we were scripted into hating Brenda, we're scripted yeah. into hating Prince Andrew. Um, and then, yes, absolutely. I'm like, I initially, I wrote these, the 40 poems over about five months at the end of last year. And like, I was often just like, oh, and this is what happened today. And this is going right in the poem. Um, but now I'm just like, oh God, I really need to open it up and have like, you know, hello pandemic. I actually referenced TV as a kind of pandemic earlier and there's that. And um, also at different points alongside the Me Too, there's smaller hints in thinking about Black Lives Matter, like the yeah. sort of, you know, the actual yep. history of Walgett. And that's also something I really want to draw out, like, you know, what it is to watch the nine minutes of George, George Floyd yep. dying yep. and then to watch all the, you know, the Congress people on their knees for those minutes um, and the different crowds of people on their knees reenacting in memory to understand what nine minutes is yeah, um, and worrying about Nancy Pelosi's knees at the same time. So, yeah. uh, yes, I'm probably going to go back in, pull out a couple of the poems that I don't think are quite working or uh, maybe, maybe get a little bit too general in thinking about modes rather than particular shows and then go back in um, with uh, a response to right now. And I'm not sure if it'll be just part of the whole sequence or almost a kind of epilogue. Yeah, All right, cool, thank you. Um, I'm mindful that we've got sort of, we've got not much time. So I'm wondering if um, anybody else would like to jump in and ask some questions. Thanks Joshua, yeah, we've got um, six minutes. Guy has a question. Guy, you have a good yes, Sorry, just trying to work out how to unmute, unmute myself. Right. Um, yeah, thanks so much, Kate. That was that was great. Um, yeah, I love the way um, you're kind of moving back and forth in the poems between the experience of you know immersion in TV and then you know as Joshua was talking about you know history or the actuality of the present and the way those things are kind of like you know mixed mixed together in the poem poems. Um, I just had a question really, I mean, I kind of have a lot of things, I guess, that kind of emerge out of my encounter with these poems. Um, and I don't really have anything particularly, um, you know, well formulated to say. Um, I was, I just, um, so I've got a couple of things. So I was kind of interested in, in the fact that you're kind of also writing these essays. And I just wondered if you could talk a bit more about those and how they, how you see those relating to the poems and what, the, you know, because it sounds like you're kind of addressing, you know, similar material. And so how they, they interrelate and, you know, how they're doing things similarly and differently. Um, because you were talking earlier about the lyric essay and the, your kind of felt 
uh, you're feeling that, you know, often that kind of, you know, uh, lyric aspect is not really kind of there um, in examples of that genre. Um, and then I just had one, and I, was, I can put this, I was going to put this in the chat, but I'll say it now because I've got the floor. Um, I was just uh, thinking, do you know Andrea Long Chu's essay on bad TV, which is about me too and TV? I do not. So it's in M plus one, so it's online, but I can, I'll put the, I'll put the details in the chat. Yeah, okay, but it's a, it's a very, it's a very kind of <laughs> interesting and provocative essay about, you know, yeah, the, again, the kind of, you know, the mixing between, you know, the lived experience of Me Too and, and the TV and watching it on TV. Um, yeah. And, and the kind of, you know, the, the, yeah, the kind of interplay between, yeah, fictional TV and, and real life. You know, I'm also really interested that bad TV, uh, um, like, you know, just in the terms of trashy mm -hmm. TV is something that doesn't get a lot of critical attention besides mm -hmm. that very first, like, do you watch it or not to an audience? And yet, obviously, it's really popular. Um, and so, you know, take something like the podcast running from cops to actually examine overall what the impact of something like that is because mm -hmm. TV critics have bailed. Um, in terms of the essays, the essays are starting from a slightly different angle um, because um, they're actually about illness, mm -hmm. um, like but real physical and illness that like I've sort of had uh, and then coming back and thinking about how television has accompanied and shaped that experience. So um, the essay that's coming out in the Australian Book Review in September now um, called The Dolorometer, which is about some surgeries and pain studies I took part in, but is also thinking about um, some conversations from Grey's Anatomy as well as from film and thinking through like that. And so I'm, I'm deep in a rewatch of ER right now because I want to think about writing an essay about how, like there's a lot of talk around Black Lives Matter about, you know, have we heroized the police too much through TV? Mm -hmm. um, and especially again, sort of a female experience of doctors and the way they treat female pain, which is sort of, there's been a lot of pain studies that are quite interesting, mm -hmm. um, how TV interacts with that. Um, so similarly, like the Brenda and sort of Shannon Doherty and breast cancer is coming up from the fact that, you know, I was caring for a friend with breast cancer for and driving her to chemo, et cetera, and thinking through, you know, the whole pink ribbon thing. Mm -hmm. um, so there's sort of a slightly different angle that's probably more of, overtly critical but it's still doing a similar work of like this is my experience and this is mm -hmm. tv mm -hmm. um but it's also a space that i get to like write more about like actual criticism so mm -hmm. um like there's a great book on 90210 of all things it's like mm -hmm. a, a woman going and watching a whole season and recording conversations with like teenage girls in the 90s and then doing like a serious sort of so sociological like trying to un unpack exactly what it means to them um and so like yeah getting into some of that right thank you yeah that 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 kind of um obviously links interestingly to what Sue's going to be talking about I, I guess as yeah well. totally yeah. when I was reading uh, <laughs> yeah, Sue's yeah, piece on audio yeah, yeah, I was just like yeah, oh yeah this yeah. is all the stuff I'm thinking yeah. about too. yeah 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 okay thank you we have um just over a minute left so someone who's got a, a burning question jump in there's lots of stuff going on in the chat yeah, yeah, parallel yeah. chat stuff yeah. And I wanted to say that there's heaps of, there, there's lots of really interesting stuff for you in the chat. There's been, um, Sue and other people have given lots of good, good resources for you. So, oh, um, yeah, there's heaps for you to kind of move forward with. Um, I think let, let's move on to Sue because I think it is a good segue to, to, to talk about yeah. Sue and, and audience. Um, but again, uh, thank you so much, Kate, for, for sharing the work with us today. I wanted to show you, you the terrible thing about Zoom is that it never shows you where your badge, your badge is. So I just want to show you my test pattern badge. Oh, thank um, you. I don't know if the <laughs> test pattern means anything to anybody anymore, but yeah. it means, means a lot well, to and I wanted to Thank because I, I asked Joshua to be my respondent in part because he's the only one of you that I've actually watched TV with. Yeah. So, we watched, we watched the best episode of Judge Judy ever. ever. It was about somebody keying a car because they had a, a um, Hillary, Clinton, uh, sticker. Hillary Clinton sticker on the car. So it was a pretty amazing episode. Yep. Um, but yeah, on that note, thank you very much, Kate. And I'll see you in the real world sometime soon, I hope. Bye-bye. Yep. Thank you. Cool.
Thanks, Kate, and thanks, Joshua. And um, as a few people have mentioned, there's a through line here today, which seems to be around uh, media audiences and the way, not just the way that, not just the objects of media production, but also the way they are received and uh, incorporated into our own experiences and lives, which means that um, our next presentation by Sue Turnbull with Renee Middlemost as respondent um, may help to draw together some of these ideas in um, um, a lucid way, and in, indeed the chapter itself is is very lucid. So um, I'll turn over to Sue and Renee and start my timer, and you can tell us how you'd like to organise your half hour. Hello. Um, I'm so sorry again. Apologies for the computer drama. Um, <laughs> but it all seems to be working again now. Um, so I spoke to Sue about essentially what I've done is kind of summarised and pulled out some key points that I thought Sue could respond to as we kind of work our way through the chapter, um, which will also sort of bring in people that might not have been able to read it in time. Um, so today, as, as you all know, I'm responding to Sue's chapter two, um, what is a media audience in Sue's recently published book, Media Audiences, Is Anybody Watching? Um, so I've been lucky to, enough to read through most of the book now and it's it's one of those great books that you can just read as an enjoyable read um, and not just as a, you know, serious academic text. So I really wanted to thank Sue for letting me read it um, and respond to this today. I think it's a really important contribution to the field and I can see, you know, myself and others getting a lot of use out of this. So um, I just wanted to say that up front. So I thought um, maybe I'd ask Sue if she wanted to tell us a little bit about the inspiration for the book or how it kind of came about before we dive into the chapter. Um, thank you so much. And um, Joshua, I've got my, I've got my um, TV pencil <laughs> holder that I found in an op shop. So I've got a show and tell here as well. Um, all right, this is the book, and um, I'm, I gave you a draft chapter two because I couldn't come into work to photocopy it in, um, in, in time. So you got a, a draft, and I apologize for the, the minor typos, and the photos may have changed a little bit in the final book. But I was asked to write this book, I think six years ago, in the series Key Concerns in Media Studies. Now, I did my PhD as an ethnographic audience research project. I spent a year in a secondary school in um, outer Melbourne, Western Melbourne. Um, and what I was trying to understand was the role of the media in the lives of a group of young women. I was trying to replicate a study called Learning to Labour by Paul Willis, a sociological account of, of um, the formation of masculinity. And I was, people were, everybody was talking in the early, you know, in the 80s about the um, second wave of feminism was hot and the role of the media in shaping femininity and shaping women was um, a key issue. And I was very much in the, I want to find out what's actually going on on the ground. So I'd done my research in the 80s and then over the last, oh, oh my God, 40 years, um, I've been teaching about media audiences. So I thought when they asked me to do this book, total breeze, I got it. <laughs> I've been working in this field for 40, 50 years. I got it nailed. All right, there is a folder on my desk with possibly 10 versions of this book. Every break I would start in on it and every break I would come to a, a halt and go, oh, I don't know what the fuck I'm trying to do, I'm really. And then I realized that this is deeply ironic because my problem is I don't know who my audience is. It was actually a problem of audience. I, the, the debates about audience research, there is a, a very expansive field. I'm actually co-editor of a journal called Participation. It's the online journal of media audience and um, reception. And Renee is part of that now too. And so I know the debates that are going on. There are heated debates going on all the time. But I didn't want to engage with my fellow academics. I actually wanted to write a book that would be an introduction to the field and to thinking about audiences that my students could read, that undergraduates could read, that they would have a sense that 
the field of audience research extends over 100 years and before that even in terms of thinking about audiences people have always been thinking about and worrying about audiences so i wanted to give that sense of breadth and i wanted to also give the sense of the patterns because there are recurring patterns of anxiety and concern around audiences with every new form of technology and i wanted to take that long view to give them a sense of how to think about where we are now. So you got chapter two, which is actually the shortest, um, which is what is, is about the different technologies from the book <laughs> through film, through to the present day and, and the repetition of anxieties around those technologies. The next chapter is about content. And again, a, a certain degree of repetition about the kinds of content that have been deemed more dangerous or more worrying or more concerning. And the next chapter is actually about the patterns in who gets researched, right? So that always children and young people, always children and young people because they're the future. So there's a pattern of concern about that. There's a pattern of, of a concern around vulnerable audiences who are perceived as in class terms, lower class, and this goes back to Matthew Arnold and you know culture and anarchy in the in the nineteenth century. So those sorts of concerns, um, and the people who don't get researched, like politicians, middle class men, you know, middle aged men, um, who who doesn't get. And then the last chapter was always all was about methodology, and really and an, in some ways a uh, a bit of a spiel about why i thought and kate's poems are a beautiful illustration of this that the only way you can study a media audience is to actually study the media that they're using in their everyday life and how it relates to them and at that point i'm asking question what is the value of media audience research to who is it valuable and why aren't we making it more valuable to the audiences with whom we are researching? Um, you know, when we're talking to audiences and when we're interviewing audiences, what are they getting out of it? So that's a very sort of broad picture and that sort of, I think, sets, um, perhaps gives you some insight into the struggle that this little book has been. And I have to say that yesterday, um, Edinburgh University Press offered us a book contract for our next book, which is on um, transnational television from Nordic to the Outback. And I'm thinking to myself, hooray, and then I'm going, oh, what have I let myself in for? So, you know, the new book is on its way. I'm already over this one, but let's deal with it. <laughs> no, no, that was that was great. And you've you've also kind of touched on some of the things that I wanted to kind of chat to you about um and i can really see this this basically this is kind of like the book version of what sue and i have been doing with our first years in many ways and i'm like oh it's it's a delight so i'm really happy to be doing this um and to have read it finally <laughs> um so i guess just to dive into chapter two so um as sue said chapter two opens with asking the reader what they think of when they consider an audience and it might be something that you know a lot of people don't consider i suppose unless you're really thinking about this stuff clearly so you know a lot of the our ideas about what an audience might be are probably quite bound up with that idea of the legacy media you know you think of a lot of people sitting together in a certain space and um, I guess like everything else that we're doing now the current circumstances we find ourselves in have kind of informed and coloured how I've thought about this chapter as well and um, kind of really underlined how relevant it is in thinking about audiences in different contexts. So um, Sue so kind of talks, talked you through the discussion around technology and access and how we're consuming content as well and this idea um, particularly in this chapter Sue talks about like the way that smartphones have altered the texture of our lives and I really like that kind of quote it reminds me of a lot of the research coming out around like affect and the audience and you know why we feel so attached to things um coming at it as well from a fan studies perspective I suppose so I really liked the quote in there from Greenfield um as a way of kind of thinking about 
the transformation of the everyday and rituals um, and thinking, I suppose, about maybe the new rituals we're putting in place for ourselves at the moment, um, given that we're staying, staying at home a bit more often. So I was wondering, Sue, if you wanted to um, make a remark at all about like new rituals um, of audiences and where you think that might kind, kind of be going, I suppose, at the moment. Yeah, it, look, it, it, it ties up absolutely with that notion of developing protocols about new technologies and how you handle them and how you manage them. And um, it, it, it's really interesting because, you know, as I say, the old technologies really haven't disappeared. You know, we're still listening to the radio and now we're listening to podcasts and um, we're still watching television, but we may be watching it on our on our um, computer and we're, we're still in social situations where we have to negotiate those kinds of situations. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm still in the process of learning how to manage my mobile phone. Um, what I choose to do on it and what I choose not to do on it. I know what it can, I know what it can do, but there are some things that I, don't want to do on it. Oh, like, everyone's frozen. Everyone's frozen. No, I haven't frozen. You, you haven't frozen. I think. All good here. We're, we're we're okay. You've just frozen a bit, Monet. It'll it'll click back into life. This is this is a a beautiful example of what I'm talking about. As we learn to manage, you know, being an audience in this kind of a setting, um, that it's 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 tricky, but we. The more we do it, the more we learn what we can do and what we can't do. Um, and I'm interested in some of the new kind of practices that are emerging. Um, there's something called cocooning, which is when you go to bed with your, and, and I can see Kate nodding because it's, it's, it's very much a, a, a young people thing. My son keeps his computer um, under his bed so that when he goes to bed, he watches things in bed in a cocooned environment. Um, and it's it's become a thing and I will cocoon to watch um, YouTube in fact because I know I'm not going to watch it on any other screen but I'll go and watch what I what I want to watch on YouTube so that we we develop ways of using the technology to suit the format and the content and what we want to do with it so I'm more I mean I think basically i'm an ethnographer so i'm i'm interested in the ethnic in the ethnography of these technologies their their adaptation and the way in which they're incorporated into what is um now really this this complex there is no there is the media and then there's daily life it's not that at all we are in the media in our daily lives all the time now and we're not always an audience so it's it's at what point does audiencing become a practice? And that just leads me to um, the new buzzword that's emerged and we're about to do a special issue on it is engagement. So that how you assess or um, measure an, an audience might well have to do with where they sit on a continuum of engagement from non-engagement to high engagement and in fact high engagement you may hate something but it actually means that you're highly engaged in it so there's a kind of what they call a spectrum of engagement and this is emerging as a way of thinking about how how you might imagine audiences oh we lost renee she's gone bless her heart um, well, well renee's probably um leaving the meeting and trying to reboot her, she's probably trying to reboot her so, participation so um, carry on sue and anyone else maybe might like to jump in and engage sue on some of the things in the article too okay um i might just say one of the things um that you didn't get to read um which is in the the, the big historical overview is the fact that some of the most interesting research on audiences ever was conducted in the 1920s and 30s in relation to cinema going in America. And there was a whole series of, stu of studies. There were about, I think they were originally imagined at 14 and there were actually 11 done called the pain fund studies. And they were actually um, initiated by 
a group that were worried about literacy, but also about the moral effect of the movies on, on young people. Again, you know, young people being the, the canaries in the mine, as it were. But one of the studies that was never published was this remarkable um, ethnography of movie houses in East Fa Harlem in New York. And the researcher went into all of these movie houses in order to see what their function were, was as public spaces. And it's about the, the, the way gangs used to meet there, the way in which families used to go there in winter because it, they could, you pay your money and you could stay in all day. So they went in with their blankets. Parents used to dump their children there at the beginning of the day when they went to work. Cars were sold. There was this just extraordinary range of activities before you even got to what were they watching. So Renee, are you back? No, nope. not, she's not back yet. And the, the point that you made there, Sue, just reminded me of the, the, the part of the, this chapter where you talk about how, you know, the equivalent today might to what you just talked about of going into the cinema um, might be going into a cafe and looking over people's shoulders and what they're looking at on their phones. But that would be regarded as a, a very poor kind of um, research practice protocol ethically these days. And you might get in trouble from the person themselves as you're leaning over their shoulder. I know, but I'm so curious. I mean, on trains, I'm desperate to know what people are watching and what people are listening to. <laughs> I spent all my time trying to see whilst being very surreptitious, you know, because I am intrigued by, by that range. And, it, you know, when we brought the Hong Kong students over and they get mentioned in the book, um, they put up 42. I recently did the same thing with the students in, in Southwest Sydney, Chris, and I had some, um, it, it was a discovery day, and I put them into little groups, and I got them to list, and the group, one group of girls got 72 different things that they accessed or did with their, with their smartphone. And I thought, my God, it's just exploding. Not all of those were what you might call audiencing in the sense of engaging with um, content that was widely distributed. You know, they were, you know, doing weather, doing banking, checking this, checking that. But there was a, an enormous, uh, you know, rise in the number of things that they had available to do on their phones. And that's the difference between um, my generation, who is kind of, you know, a little bit tentative about this, and the current generation who've just embraced this as a screen on which they can do anything. There she is. Up, <laughs> oh, you're muted, Renee. There you go. I'm on my phone now, so hopefully, can you hear me now? Yes, yes and perfect ah. example, she's on her phone. <laughs> Excellent, okay, I'm so sorry. What a dud responder, Sue. <laughs> what have you been talking about anyway? Uh, well, I was just um, tap dancing, really, in public, but um, and talking about the book. So, do do you want to push on to the next question? And then we've already covered it. Uh, but Lucas, how are we doing for time? Is it time to just yeah. open to others? We've got twelve minutes left with you both. Okay. All right. Well, I might just kind of skip forward a bit. Um, I also I, I had questions to around the studying of audiences. So you said um, that some of the latter chapters were about methodology, um, and I was interested particularly in the section where you were talking about the unreliable self-reporting um, from audiences and the the imperfect nature of studying audiences and the kind of methods that we have around that. So I was wondering if maybe you wanted to pick up on that as a point to discuss. Oh yeah. Well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, for a long, long time, A.C. Nielsen, for example, used um, diaries to record radio listening. And I think they still, they still do. It is, um, but I used to get A.C. Nielsen to come out and talk to students when I was at um, La Trobe University about the diary method. And they would give this extraordinary kind of presentation of the statistical reliability of their sampling. But when it came down to it, what they gave people was a paper booklet and they had to say which station they listened to for how long and what their preferences were. And of course, what people did was that they would actually tick the stations that they wanted 
to continue and that they liked rather than what they were actually listening. It was like a voting system uh, rather than actually what they were doing. And that gap between what people say they do and what they actually do and what the nature of the affect is, which is the kind of thing that you can only get to in Kate's poems, may I say, is, you know, what is the, what is that impact? That's extremely hard to get to. And e it's even hard to get to in a one-to-one -one interview. Um, there's a very famous piece of audience research um, that was done um, in the 90s, I think, late, late 80s, early 90s, um, where a very earnest um, German woman in America, soap operas, everybody was concerned about how many people were watching soap operas. And she and a colleague went, they wanted to find out um, why people were watching these soap operas, like Bold and Beautiful, and what they were getting out of it. And, these, and they got volunteers. So they went to the house of these two men who proceeded to tell them how they loved watching them because they hated them and how much more superior they were than what they were watching on television. And the, the, I think the essay is called something like, you know, diary of a um, troubling interview, because what the researchers realized was that what, what was going on in the interview was a form of impression management. Mm. So that rather than admitting to liking something or the positives or the engagement, the whole nature of that interview was based on trying to impress people from the university about um, their good taste as mm. viewers. So, so there is this extraordinarily, extraordinary problem of, um, of the interview setting, which I've discovered interviewing children, interviewing adults, interviewing parents, because there is what they think you want to hear and what they think they should say. And this you know overlying ongoing um suspicion that television viewing is to be disapproved of now what's wonderful about the current era and i think it was pointed that, that people have pointed to the wire as, as the moment when people who would never admit that they watched american television finally discovered something that they thought was um Shakespearean, Dickensian, you know, and used all the literary terms to actually evaluate a piece of popular culture, the Sopranos being the same. So we're now in an era um, when people who in the past have been reticent about saying that they were gripped by television now feel okay because television of a certain sort has got a certain kind of cachet, though um, Married at First Sight still doesn't. <laughs> yeah it's like it's the quality versus bad tv kind of scenario isn't it um so i had up on my screen before i lost the internet um your fantastic diagram so part of the chapter um then moves on to sort of talk about audiencing so john fisk um the social experience of being with friends and I suppose, again, how we're adapting at this current moment to, you know, maybe having Zoom parties and talking about different things. I've been doing that with friends um, in the UK, obviously the all important drag race catch ups. <laughs> um, but, you know, obviously we can see this online, the, the social TV element. And I actually think that's, you know, probably the best part of TV watching, like reading through the, the comments afterwards is wonderful. Um, so what Sue's done when I mentioned the diagram is she's revised the hierarchy of human needs. So Maslow's um, hierarchy. And um, I don't know what, is it on page 28 in, in what you've got in front of you? I did intend to share my screen <laughs> with all of you and show you the diagram. I don't think we go um, up to page 28, Renee. We go up to page 18. Oh, okay. So yeah. it's page 28 in the published book. Sorry. <laughs> um, so anyway, there's a, a wonderful little diagram that um, yeah, maybe yeah. Sue, I okay. there you go. Maybe you might like to talk us through your revision of this diagram. Well, my re I guess what I'm interested in is, is the practice of audiencing and turning that noun, the audience into a practice. Um, and as I was saying, when you were offline, the, the, the new thing that's emerged is this notion of engagement. Mm. 
Um, but again, engagement is a noun. And you, if you want to turn it into, I'm trying to turn it into a gerundive, I think it is, where you've got, um, gerund is a present participle used as a noun. So you switch things around. So you've got, yeah, I'm getting nods. So I do remember my grammar. So audiencing or engaging then come up as things that you do rather than you know people that you are. So we all do these things, and it's that practice that I'm that I'm interested in. And and the fact that those practices we all do them for the same reasons. And I, I go for um, information, for entertainment, for fun, distraction, consolation. Um, the various aspects of identity formation and social activity that go along with looking for recognition, support, and self-expression. So we all use all the media for all those things as part of our audiencing, but we do it with different kinds of um, content and with different types of technology. Yeah, I love I love that idea that um, you know it meets a different need depending on the kind of day or time that you're in. Um, I've been really interested in this kind of idea of comfort TV for a while. Like, you know, what do people watch when they need an escape? And um, for me, it's it's Great British Bake Off or um, Drag Race because both of those are kind of worlds that appeal to me in some way. They're you know warm, fuzzy kind of spaces where things are either delicious or glittery and colorful um so yeah i think that is is really fascinating kind of especially again thinking about the kind of crazy times that we're in so um kind of just moving towards the last couple of points because i know we're running out of time um I might just move to the last thing I wanted to ask Sue about. So basically, Sue winds up this chapter, um, so chapter two, with kind of reflecting on the kinds of questions that maybe we should be asking ourselves when we're conducting audience research. And of the concluding questions that Sue posed, there was one on methodology and the appropriateness and how the audience is being constructed. And this idea of how the audience is being constructed, I think, is something that you know, even though we're thinking more about fans now and how they engage with the industry and how there's kind of maybe a bit more of equality in that kind of field now, I think this idea of how the audience is constructed is still something that people are grappling with a lot. And I, I still feel that there's this impression that, you know, people are, you know, taking content too seriously or, you know, it's just a TV show. I think there's probably still a bit of that attitude still around. So I was wondering... Um, you know, if you think the project of how audiences is constructed still has a ways to go. Well, for the purposes of research, the researcher always constructs an audience, right? I mean, we know that the thing that fan studies did was that fan studies found an audience because the fans had constructed themselves as an audience. So fan studies one of the reasons why that really took off in the 90s and through is because um, academics could be part of the audience of fandom and it was all around them and they were in it and therefore they could talk about the engagement from the inside at the same time as they were kind of, you know, looking at the broader phenomenon and the edges of that phenomenon. But for the most part, every study of an audience is a kind of artificial creation. You draw the boundaries around it. You, you try to find a group of people that will talk to you um, about their experiences, or you find a group of people who are willing to record what they do, etc. So in some ways, the audience doesn't exist for audience research. It has to be created. Um, but of course, in that economic realm, the, and I think I, I actually do say it in this, um, the battle for those who produce media is the battle for attention. Mm. If everybody wants the attention of the audience, because if you've got the attention of the audience, um, now we've shifted that you're not going to be able to sell, sell your audience to advertisers because the audience is in this game of avoiding advertising. That's why we're willing to pay for pay fit TV. That's why we'll watch Netflix and pay the money because we don't want to be interrupted by advertising so there's been a whole shift um, in in the economy of audiences um, as audiences have gained more power in and have more options in order to escape the various um, 
ways that sought to advocate him for exposure to advertising. So that's a really interesting um, new dimension. And of course, when you turn to something like YouTube, um, YouTubers have got to have an enormous number of followers to get anything like any return on their investment in terms of what they're producing. It's got to be in the millions. So YouTube is not playing the game very nicely at all in this new economy of um, audiences becoming producers and creating their own material. They just, they, they're going to continue to exploit audiences as long as possible. Mm. Cool. Well, um, I just wanted to thank you again for letting me respond to your book. I really, um, I'm looking forward to continuing my read in there. Thank um, you. So yeah, thank you. I'm sorry again about all the technical problems. This is literally the first time I've had any problems this whole time. <laughs> Renee and yeah. Sue, there's, I reckon, speaking of audiences, there's probably a few burning um, responses that are lurking in our group gathered here today. If, if anyone would like to jump in, we're actually running out of time now, but we could... Um, move into from specific questions and comments for Sue and Renee into a more general discussion for a few minutes. Yeah. May I make a, a, a quick, well, maybe not a quick comment, a comment. Um, it, it's, it's, it's linking back to that idea of television encompasses everything from Kate to then Sue, your, what you mentioned there about we don't want to engage with advertising. It's really interesting for me because my experience of watching old old movies is always because it's intercut with a Marble Effect ad or the you know Kelso Car Centre ad, and that's central to my reading of what Vertigo as a film is. Um, and recently, I tried to teach um, uh, something to students, and I was using um, Lotto as a kind of example. Um, and just I realised that the students had never seen the Lotto <laughs> uh, moment. They'd never seen the supplementary number, those guys sitting at the table, all of that stuff. So I'm just wondering about, in a, in a kind of broader context, and this, this relates back to Aaron and the conversation that took place in, in, in your work as well, is that it's the, it's the kind of extra, it's the stuff around it which I think makes uh, engaging with um, media more, more important. It's not that you're just watching Vertigo. Um, and it's the same thing about the Harlem cinema. You're not just watching the film, you're watching everybody else in the cinema and what's going on in that space. So I wondered if, if the three responders, uh, the three um, uh, speakers today wanted to speak to that idea of the kind of space around um, the, the, the central subject and how that kind of uh, uh, works in relation to their own work. Um, if that's a question, I don't know if it is or not. Do either of the... The Aaron, do you want to take this? Or? Yeah, I'll, I'll just briefly mention that I had um, Maya Newell come and talk to students last semester about In My Blood It Runs. And that, like, I was just so uh, uh, awestruck by the amount of work that they do in impact production, um, that they have, you know, multiple impact producers. And it's almost like, and, and I guess the sad thing for me as a kind of... Um, pre-millennial, well, like the thing I'm pre-millennial filmmaker, is that it, f it feels like the films can no longer stand on their own legs, that the media no longer has its own weight, that people can no longer just watch something and act on it. It's like it needs these call to actions. It needs this kind of, okay, now click here, now do this, yeah. now. Like, and I find that quite frustrating. I know that there's really interesting kind of creative opportunities, but it is this space of just so much media that how Aaron, people navigate. What's, um, what is impact production? It's marketing, but without the money, I guess it's, 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 well, it's mainly used in the documentary context. So you're making a film in order to do something. So in, in my blood, it runs, they had three objectives. The main one be raise the age, hashtag, hashtag raise the age. So previously where you might've just commissioned a study guide or something like that. And you've got the general marketing team. Nowadays you have a team of impact producers that will, uh, design um, a whole campaign around, you know, events, uh, UNHCR screenings, talks, you know, different kinds of information documents, um, really intricate kind of ma market, what are essentially, well, previously would have been marketing campaigns, but geared towards the audience actually doing something. Um, Aaron, your, your sort of um, take on that, if I can just sort of draw that out a bit further, is that there's, there's a certain, while it's a worthy um, initiative in order to make a change in the world, there's something lost in the aesthetics, the autonomy of the aesthetics of the, of the filmmaking process or the media production in its own, for its own sake or something like that. And I think going back to Kate's work and something that I've found quite sort of cathartic about the, the stream of consciousness is just the temporality in which we're living in. 
that it's it's never kind of you know we don't turn off and turn on like we used to you know like and having a three-year-old i i you know uh, i'm having a lot of trouble controlling viewing periods um whereas you know when i was growing up there was a 330 slot when cartoons were on and you know that's all you're interested in then you turn off then the audience ship kind of you know evaporates um well, you now really yeah nowadays you know it's up to us to negotiate this and i and i think most of us have a lot of trouble doing that and i think it's really interesting where broadcasters and netflix and chris i think you know has talked about this before um how they uh, are influencing this space you know the, the way the sbs and abc are reprimanded for actually getting hold of good content and telling people this stuff is good whereas netflix is making all this money on producing stuff based on algorithms um so i mean you know how the media is produced in this space i think is very well i see it as problematic but again i'm sitting on this sort of you know moral high ground of you shouldn't be watching that you shouldn't be watching this which is apparently old hat um so yeah i i, I just don't know what's going on in this space and i i, I really yeah, you know think it's such a, 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 a an amazing task that sue's taken on board to try to kind of understand it <coughs> Kate, did you want to say something? I was also going to say, just in that, um, all the things that sort of surround the, um, like, you know, avoiding ads, but also like all those social and, and like that concern with needs. Um, I was, I happened to be having yet another conversation about Pretty Little Liars last night with a um, partner stepdaughter here, uh, and, but also about the way, you know, we embed ads into the television shows now. Um, weird side conversation that has nothing to do with the plot that is basically an advertisement for an upcoming film it was like insidious too did you see the first one oh it was so scary it was like completely out of character it was just that that moment um but also that sense that it it was actually a reflection of the way that we now sell each other the stuff um based on how we watch um but also, like, just thinking about all the ways that TV watching sort of spills out into social spaces, like, I don't know, how I do my hair when I just watched an episode of something and I really liked the hairstyle, like, just really, really shallow stuff that I'm probably not meant to say as a serious person. Um, but also then, because I worked for seven years for Foxtel in their call centre, like, just answering customer queries. And um, the real absolute distress when they couldn't afford it and it was turned off and they were late in their bills as well as the interesting relationships that both elderly audiences but also um audiences with disability concerns uh conversations i had through the relay service with deaf customers as well as um with blind customers and how much that was something that is definitely informed my own sensitivity to what television has meant to me and sort of trying to un unpack that. And so I think that also comes into like Sue's, that hierarchy of needs we bring to television. Um, I just, there's been a, a little conversation emerging in the chat, Kate, and I'm just going to, um, I'm just actually going to go, Jen Saunders said, audience research on ourselves would be a great project. Actually, autoethnography <laughs> is indeed a big thing in terms of television watching and in fact that's what Kate has done in her poems in in a way and there is a, there is another essay that could be written on that in television studies and um, well, I'm also actually trying to write about how television is used in poetry and so I've been sort of coming across a number of different sort of ways of proposing because um, ekphrasis, that description of a form, is not really working for television so there's both the sort of interpretation of television as a myth but also as ambient. Right, um, right. And so there's not many poets I've found that are doing the sort of what I'm doing right now. Um, but someone like Claudia Rankine uh, in Don't Let Me Be Lonely, television just keeps coming back and this idea of television and the relationship mortality and how it is that we figure this really dominant form within this really sort of unread but important, I say, form of poetry is something that I'm, I'm sort of starting to write about. Um, I've, I've got to quickly ask you, you, you don't by any chance have a poem on um, watching Prisoner and Wentworth, do you? Not yet. Because <laughs> I'm doing, I've been asked to write an introduction to a book and I'm just thinking I'd rather use your poem. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you could take commissions, Kate, to watch a particular <laughs> series and produce oh, yeah. one of your... Well, I've already gifted some of these poems. I still haven't given Chrissy her poem, on, which, which includes The Wire, and I still haven't written Joshua's poem. Judge Judy. Judge on. Judy. Uh, but I have already written for Shady on the OA. So, just on that point of Wentworth, I was so interested to note that a there's an AFL commentator that always opens his chat show with a comment on Wentworth. <laughs> he loves, and he always gets into trouble because he's on Foxtel, not <laughs> ABC and whatever Wentworth is on. But it's just television is a, a passion for some people that it bleeds into their lives. Yes, I was really struck by that in that point, Kath, by um, uh, Kate's um, reference to the idea of how autobiography or biography doesn't seem to incorporate the amount of time people spend watching telly. Um, and just how, you know, it's a bit like how you never see someone go to the toilet in a, in a movie or something. Um, you know. <laughs> just bracket it out as too banal somehow to be remarkable. And yet it's what we talk about when we meet up with each other. Kate, would you like to talk about, about that a little bit more? Like how could you write a biography where you incorporated or an autobiography where you incorporated a lot of stories about the, the years that, of, of time that you spent watching telly? <laughs> Well, I mean, I think that the Biblio memoir is exactly the model. Like you've got someone like Francis Spofford talking about the boy that the child the books built or some of the academics like Patricia Myers Spax um, reading sort of her memoir of rereading uh, and reflecting on what that means. Uh, and so I think that actually there is a whole um, world of that that needs to be thought about like why we're lighting the television um i think also i've been you know i've been reading a lot of different sort of television critics uh books and like emily nussbaum is the one that sort of talks about that idea that like if it's not prestige it disappears but it disappears into a really big conversation um and so when i account for my time like a lot of the poems i sort of say well you know i could write this biblio memoir like you know i've read all these doorstop books like i if you get me off on dickens i can go at the same pace as i can go about like pretty little liars or buffy or the 100 which we're watching for comfort right now because we have a strange idea of comfort over here um but it's just that sense of it's reading the thing and what it does and then how that affects you and how it interacts with the time. So it's both that sort of cultural moment, but then it's that really personal um, moment. And so when, you know, Francis Buffett is thinking about imaginary worlds and what they open up in reading Narnia, for example, like for me, well, I had that with Narnia, but I also had that with you know, Shira and Mysterious Cities of Gold. So um, those are, are ways in which you can sort of account for the parts that are not given the space in popular work. I, I think we do have the, 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 the it, it, it's possible to it, it present that in, in kind of memoir space. And I think that the fact that we, you know, the blog space is a kind of memoir is, is an active yeah. a, a memoir space. So I, I, that's, that's not the kind of issue for me. For me, for me it's, it's it, what I think is quite amazing about your poems, Kate, is that the fact that you're exploring it within an art form like poetry um, because I think it's easy to talk about how much we like, like um, how television influences in, in that kind of memoir space. But in fiction, I think it's actually a different kind of um, space. There's very little space in books where a, a, a character reads another book. Um, whereas I think about the epiphanies that I had in the journey of my life, and it's reading Wide Sagasso Sea or something, and it's, it's that moment of how you, how you tell that experience of of reading a book or seeing a television and that that taking you on the next step of your fictional or real journey. Um, so I, I'd be interested in, in how we tell books about the experience of reading a book or, or if we, we write films about the experience of watching TV. It's it's that kind of, without being metafictional and without being kind of, you know, meta-meta, it's, it's actually that idea of how we engage with that form of experience which does change our lives um, in, a, in a space which is about telling moments where people change their lives, if that makes sense. So that's, yeah, that's what I took from, from your poems, Kate, that we, we live, we change our lives according to this, this space, but we don't talk about that, that epiphany that takes place. Um, uh, rant over. <laughs> Sorry. Um, thanks, Joshua. And I'm just looking at the time. We're coming up towards our 12.30 mark. 
Um, so perhaps if there's any kind of final um, thoughts, if there's someone that hasn't um, piped up and has got something burning to say before we, we begin to wrap up. Sue said she had an answer to something I'd popped on. Oh, it, it, it was about what people choose to watch um, in times of stress. And um, I remember I just had a, a, a really kind of interesting anecdote that I had a friend once who was going through an absolutely terrible time. Her husband had died and her nine-year-old son had been diagnosed with cancer. I mean, you know, double whammies in two years. And I I said, you know, what are you, how are you managing? And she said, I'm watching horror films. And I said, why? She said, because they're so visceral and so engaging that while I'm absolutely terrified, I can't think about anything else. You know, so the, 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 the text that she chose to watch had to be something that was all encompassing. And then the wonderful way in this conversation has developed in the chat has been about what people are choosing to watch during COVID that distracts them from whatever it is that COVID is that, and it's different for, for different people. I mean, if it's, if it's the same for everybody, then that would be odd. But the very fact that we're all choosing something different, like Renee is going for something like Bake Off and, and Glitter and others of us, I'm watching Mother, Father, Son, because it's also terrifying me and completely engaging me. And I go to bed upset every night, but I've stopped worrying about work. <laughs> so I can handle that. But, um, but it's really interesting what we choose to and, and what engages us in different contexts. So um, Sue, just kind of noting as well, like as something that has been burning on my mind throughout the conversation is just the clarity and of the, the, the writing style of your book. I mean, you mentioned before that you wanted to do something that was accessible to your students. And, you know, that's admirable and I think students often think that in order for something to be academic I think we fall into this as well that it has to be um, you know really obfuscated and difficult and um, the thing that's um, you know from as an audience of you know reading the this this chapter was that um, it was it almost seemed it almost seems so simple that the, that the truths that were within the writing was self-evident. There was something almost kind of a little bit scary about that. It was like that, as if the the simplicity of the language meant that it was they, these were my thoughts somehow. And I and I was waiting for like I expect this comes up in a future chapter for a for a bit of a trap where you lead my thoughts into some new ideas which I I myself haven't already had. At which point, you know, you've, you've captured me somehow. I thought I was kind of struck by the kind of artistry of the right of the simplicity of the writing in that way. Mm. Thank you very much for that. I've worked very hard over the years at. Um, I think, in some ways, and this is a bit of a confession, I don't like much, most academic writing. I really don't. I'm a failed poet novelist. I think. And I'm, I'm an essayist and I've always preferred the essay as a form of academic writing to something that, you know, barrages you with citations and, um, and evidence to start with. So, um, you know, as an editor of an academic journal for, for six years, I've read my fair share of those. But when I choose to write myself, that's not how I want to engage my reader. I want to tell my reader a story about the theory or the research that engages them and precisely leads them along a very dubious track to where I want them to be. <laughs> thank you. And um, we should wrap up now. Um, thanks everybody for, uh, it's so interesting when, you know, because we don't, we don't carefully curate these, you know, the three presentations. It's partly dependent on the serendipity of who's available at the time and who's ready to share. But there always does seem to be some kind of thread that ties things together. And especially today that has happened. Um, just to kind of, I wanted to note from the point of view of the C3P committee, um, which involves um, Sue, Kath, Travis, and also just to kind of invite and welcome Jen um, Saunders, who is coming on as our postgraduate representative. Um, and Jen, might, you might want to say a few words about um, the, I think our next gathering for the C3P is going to be around postgraduate week or what might be called uh, research week in early, is that in early September? Um, 
according to the emails, yeah, the emails flying around between Sue and Kath and the rest of us. Yes, yeah. week five. Now, look, uh, at this stage, I don't have that much to to say, Lucas. But mm. um, except, stay tuned and thank you. I'm, I'm, I enjoy these conversations so much. It's really yeah, and and we would love to have more right. post grad students along. Um, and I think that you know having you there, Jen, means that if we could have some post grad led sessions of the C three P, then um, we switch our model from being largely academic, you know, employed academic led to being and then inviting along postgrads rather the other way it could it could flip and be the other way around that we could be the audiences of a postgrad led session would would be yes. very good. Yeah great. Yeah thank you. Thanks for the welcome. It's yeah. exciting. <laughs> great. So and thanks uh, C3P yeah. in general because um is actually while a hunch, whole bunch of my other work goes more in the blue ecologies realm, uh, the poems from today in part came out of a lot of the different discussions of fan studies, especially at the symposium um, at North Wollongong in 2018, I think it was. Um, when I was asked to talk about fan studies, I was like, oh God, I have nothing intelligent to say except I'm a total fan. Um, and then sort of the way I've been stressed about that and it's come out in poems. <laughs> That's great. And it's, yeah, it's just really great. Thanks to Sue for being our um, esteemed leader of this research club um, for kind of, you know, we don't have any resources. The, the, the centre doesn't have any kind of financial resources, but what we can do is just prize out a couple of hours a month to share our research in progress with each other, which reminds us that we're, that, you know, still great things going on, even though we're, find, we're all finding it very difficult to keep up with our work. Mm. Well, thank you, Lucas, for such an excellent job in the hosting on behalf of all the presenters. Really, you did a lovely job. Thank you. You made thank us you. so welcome and calm and relaxed and, and happy. <laughs> You're welcome. Very welcome. Happy to do it this time. Thanks. Yeah. Um, well done. Thank you. So really interesting. Cool. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. And it's great to have you along too. Oh. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> next time you can talk about your trip. Maybe. We'll see how oh. we go. Yeah. Thank you. Travis, tell us from a technical point of view what you would like us to do around finishing up the recording and so on. Oh, there's nothing from a technical point of view that we... Okay. If, if there's a nice point where we can finish to end the recording, you know, <laughs> on a nice... <laughs> there seems to be some discussion in the comments about how we need some C3P badges. <laughs> also, I'm probably going to go and watch ER now. I, don't know, that's I just, um, I, Joe Sterling designed a badge for my wedding a couple of years ago. So Joe Sterling is the person who she'll design it. Um, mm -hmm. She's she's quite an extraordinary um, designer. I think she could do a really beautiful um, kind of insignia for us. So well, I'll, 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 I'll I'll be the official badge um, uh, really? leader. Yeah. Well, Travis, you know, on the C3P site, the guy Mia Lily. That's true. Mm. That's yeah, I, I was thinking thing. that. There's lots we Very could do true. with that. Mm. All right, well, on that note, we'll, let, we'll leave the badge committee to organise its own <laughs> subcommittee we'll meetings. Yeah. <laughs> and send we'll your commissions to me, TV poem commissions to me. Yes. yes. Right. <laughs> and we'll see you in about a month. Thank you. Oh, Thanks, thank everybody. You. Bye. 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 Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Bye.